The World We Create From God to Market by Thomas Bjorkman, read by Mark Meadows. The Age of Science and Free Trade. With the ever growing complexity and commercialization of society during the early modern period, the old axial myths gradually begin to show their deficiencies. In a world where several competing symbol worlds intermingle, all with equally universal claims to the one and only truth, it becomes painfully obvious that they are contradicting each other. But not only that. Under closer scrutiny, they are even revealed to be rather self-contradictory in and of themselves. Their universality does not appear as universal as before. The conceptual limitations of the religious thought perspective start to show driving thinkers to question whether more universal principles exist. Furthermore, whether the only way to determine the ultimate truth is to subject it to evidence-based inquiry. Rationality thus comes to characterise the following era. Rationality was initially a means to untangle the many conceptual contradictions of inherited religious dogma, but it quickly spills over into scientific discourse. No longer is tradition to be sufficiently relied upon. If the authorities are no longer gods, as established by the axial traditions, but merely the gods' representatives on earth, who are then to interpret the ultimate will of the divine other than our own God-given souls, the one domain where all humans are supposedly equal? Myth has to be subjected to evidence, and the means to do so are the rational faculties of our soul. The universality of the old, moral religions has to be exchanged for a more functional universality, where all people can verify the truths. No longer does it suffice merely being told what is true and right. Humans have to think for themselves. Eventually, this thought perspective will sound a death knell to all mythologies. In the wealthy northern Italian city-states of the 15th century, during what later came to be called the Renaissance, Trade has grown and given rise to a privileged class of city dwellers who seek to lift themselves above the prevailing religious thought perspective. Within a small elite of secular artists, authors and statesmen, the Roman past is rediscovered, admired and interpreted in a new light, with focus on the individual and reason. In their interpretation of antiquity, they emphasise how the human being, not God, was considered central before Christianity. This is increasingly seen as a long-lost virtue of a golden age that the thinkers and artists of the Renaissance find important to bring back. This gives the Renaissance its particular humanistic characteristics, which will shape European culture in the centuries to come. Humanism is also a distinct feature of the rational thought perspective. If the secrets of the world are to be unravelled by the rationality of the human mind, then it also follows that the human being itself, rather than religious dogma and God, should be at the centre of our attention. Perhaps the people of the Renaissance sought affirmation of their own intuitive understanding of a rational, individualistic and humanistic thought perspective that had come to resonate with the urban, cosmopolitan and highly commercialised life in Florence and Venice at this time. From here on, the rational thought perspective spreads like ripples on a pond. We begin to reflect upon the era's widespread corruption and hypocrisy within the Church in the light of antiquity's achievements, and, consequently, start to explore whether there are other, higher ideals we can strive towards. European cities grow considerably during the later Middle Ages, bringing about an economic and cultural upswing. The market is broadened and ideas spread more rapidly across a steadily larger area. The northern Italian city-states benefit from their strategic trade position and Venice becomes Europe's largest financial centre. Here, several of the market's instruments as we know them to this day are created, along with many of the structures that come to characterise the global market later on. The late Middle Ages' particular conditions, as well as historical accidents and individual political decisions, give birth to many of the financial instruments and structures that we today take for granted and regard as near-given forces of nature.
in this blossoming mercantile environment, the demand to borrow money is high, but it is partly suppressed by the church, which prohibits the charging of interest on loans. Profiteering from interest is regarded as usury, and as early as the 12th century, the Pope explicitly bans such activities. The church deliberately attempts to hold back market developments, a concern that is more or less built into the Christian symbol world, exemplified in Christ's anger towards the peddlers in the temple and Christianity's generally negative attitudes towards the rich. The rulers of the age are, however, aware that their power hinges on the money they can mobilise. Without money, it is difficult to recruit soldiers, and without soldiers, it is impossible to win wars. The financial sector also receives new tools, including a new calculation system. Advanced monetary calculations are difficult to conduct with Roman numeration, but trade with the Islamic world introduces the superior Arabic number system, which in turn was invented in India several hundred years previously, which simplifies matters considerably. The introduction of the Arabic numeration system revolutionises our financial instruments. Now it becomes much easier to make calculations, for example, percentages for calculations of interest or converting money into another country's currency that were very difficult in Roman numerals without the zero. Once again, we see how trade generates a favourable exchange of memes between cultures and symbol worlds and thereby strengthens continued development towards higher complexity. The merchants in the cities grow consistently stronger. The Medici family in Florence will, during the 14th century and several centuries onwards, dominate the European markets, and through their growing wealth, culture and politics as well. The Medici family finds ingenious ways to circumvent the church's prohibition through creative bookkeeping, developing a highly profitable banking system. In Venice, New financial instruments are introduced that still remain to this day. One such is the promissory note. The promissory note entails an agreement that a large sum of money that has been received can be paid back later in another location and in another currency. Hence, we do not have to transport large sums of money, which dramatically facilitates the efficiency of trade. Money is a medium of exchange and a store of value, but it can also be used as a measure of account. All of these have been properties of money since its invention, but new methods of taking advantage of the information provided by the latter will now revolutionise how humans organise themselves by giving rise to the economic system we call capitalism. As a measure or unit of account, money can be used to represent the values of products, services and assets and measure the relative value of a service or product in relation to someone's labour or property. The same function can also, with great accuracy, provide information about incomes and expenses. As such, it can be used to assess profits, losses and liabilities, and hence function as a means to monitor economic performance and to predict future profitability. Exact measurements of profits can be used to provide well-informed estimates about where an economic surplus should be directed to maximise the economic efficiency of production and distribution. Investing profits in order to generate even greater profits is the central feature of capitalism. However, for this revolutionising use of money to become possible, a new ancillary meta-technology of capitalism, in the words of Robert Wright, has to be invented Double-entry bookkeeping. Double-entry bookkeeping is invented in another northern Italian city-state, Genoa. It is a form of accounting which, by making the inflow and outflow of trade extremely clear, makes it possible to analyse the balance of trade with a much greater accuracy and better overview than other accounting methods. As such, it can with great precision be used to determine whether something is likely to generate profit. Both Max Weber and the German economist and sociologist Werner Sombart have considered the invention of double-entry bookkeeping foundational for capitalism. Sombart has argued that capital as a category did not even exist before this invention 
since the very concept is derived from the way double-entry bookkeeping allows us to see capital and its profits in numerical values in accounting books. Hence, the notion of capital and the understanding that it can generate profits only becomes visible to us as it starts to appear on sheets of paper in double-entry bookkeeping accounts. Only then can we begin to properly manage the risks of capital investments and make exact measurements of its profits. So, in the same way that money was written into existence, when we began to make debt recordings on clay tablets, the symbol tool of profit is written into existence when we begin to account for our incomes and expenses in accounting books. Thus started the development of the collective imaginary we now call the market. In 17th century Venice, another powerful meme appears in this new collective imaginary, the company as a legal person. This will later develop into today's limited company. Previously, merchants organised trade expeditions as personal partnerships. The investment, risk and profit were all shared and all partners took full responsibility for the joint business. But now a completely new organisation is invented as the partnership is converted into a company that is a legal person. This means that a company can enter into agreements as though it was a living human being, while no physical persons bear the responsibility for the agreement. The company also provides the prerequisites for future developments with shares for investors and thereby the means of financing that will enable larger projects by entrepreneurs and businessmen. In the development of our collective imaginary, the company is a completely new occurrence. We have now invented a creature that can have a will and intentions of its own and enter into binding legal agreements, but where the will and the intentions are separated responsibility-wise from the people who have originally formed the company and who ultimately control it. Just as with our ancestors' belief in freely floating wills in the form of spirits, the human being has now invented real spirits, freely floating wills and intentions disconnected from physical persons. Initially, how these companies can act and function are regulated in agreements between its owners. Later on, the dominant forms of companies and their operational remits are legislated by the state. Influence and rights for the various stakeholders in the company as lenders and partners are, however, regulated rather arbitrarily in various laws. The laws often favour the owners of capital at the cost of other stakeholders, for instance, and lenders have the right to use compulsory liquidation to dissolve companies that do not honour their interest payments. This may appear to us as obvious and a near natural given fact of life, but if we think about it, it becomes clear that it does not need to be this way. That capital owners to this day still have primacy over other stakeholders is merely a historical coincidence that emerged from the particular conditions of Renaissance Italy. Later, companies acquire rights that only physical persons previously had. In this way, for instance, during the early 20th century in the United States, Companies get the right of free speech and political lobbying. These freely floating spirits thus steadily start resembling humans in their rights and freedoms to act. However, the difference between them and us is that they are immortal, lack emotions and often have considerably larger financial muscles. Suddenly, the most powerful actors on the world stage are no longer individual humans but these newly invented company spirits. Yet again, we should keep in mind that many of the laws that pertain to companies and that we today take for granted as inviolable rights are the result of historical and often arbitrary decisions made in another age and under other societal circumstances. One of the most important technological inventions during this time which will lead to a revolution in the development of new thoughts, is the printing press. Printing was, however, not entirely new. In East Asia, there had been experiments with movable types several centuries before the printing press appeared in Europe, but this was extremely costly because of the large number of characters in East Asian written languages, 
which meant that the technique never caught on there. Another fateful coincidence of history that would later increase the gap between the East and the West. The Latin alphabet, with its far fewer characters, is thus much better suited for this revolutionising invention. Around 1440, Johannes Gutenberg starts using movable metal types that can easily be assembled into words and sentences. This efficient technology spreads rapidly across Europe and results in a large number of cheap books being mass-produced. To begin with, these are mostly in Latin and with religious content, but soon thereafter, on many other topics and in vernacular languages as well, which, over time, will facilitate a revolution in thought. Access to cheap books results in even more minds being interconnected across geographical boundaries and over time, which creates good conditions for the spread and cross-pollination of memes. In the wake of the Renaissance, there is growing criticism of the Church. The Catholic Church is, at this time, a rather corrupt, worldly power, but it still believes in reason, logos. So, when the Church tries to use reason to justify its actions, which are evidently in conflict with the message of the Bible, many react accordingly. The decadent lifestyle of the Renaissance popes and the fleecing of the population enrages many of the Church's subjects. The first prominent challenger is Jan Hus in Bohemia during the early 15th century. But it is the German monk Martin Luther who, in the early 16th century, succeeds in spreading the criticism, largely by utilising the newly invented printing press. Initially he attempts to reform the church, but instead he causes a schism which gives rise to the Protestant faith, dividing the Christian West into two different symbol worlds. Among other things, Luther attacks the Catholic Church's sale of letters of indulgences. He also throws out all philosophical reasoning and returns to a fundamentalist, literal interpretation of the Bible. Another decisive part of the Reformation project is the German translation of the Bible, which Luther devotes himself to during his flight from the Catholic Church, which has now outlawed him. The translation will also influence other translations, e.g. Gustav I of Sweden's Bible and the English King James Bible. In Luther's Protestant doctrine, there is no longer any advanced model of our consciousness and its potential for development. Luther throws out logos, or reason, and returns to a more concrete interpretation of the Bible. Luther's view can be exemplified by what he has written himself, such as, Reason is the devil's worst whore, and reason should be destroyed in all Christians. Luther succeeds in clearing away a lot of the old animist residuals from Christianity, such as magical beliefs in icons and saints, but reason is also thrown out. What remains is a mixture of innovative thinking and fundamentalism that will become the foundation of the Protestant faith. At the beginning of the early modern period, there is a rich and diverse environment of different competing symbol worlds in Western Europe, which receives nourishment from its Christian inheritance, its wealthy easterly neighbours, both Muslims and the Byzantine Christians, its Greco-Roman past, and now two different interpretations of Christianity. Moreover, the European continent is characterised by a large number of competing states that all strive for power and wealth, which on the whole constitutes a fruitful hotbed for the development of new cultural and technological memes. In the wake of the Reformation, the Thirty Years' War rages during the first half of the 17th century. It is principally a religious war, at least initially. Luther's teachings are adopted by a number of rulers who break their bonds with papal Rome, causing considerable conflict with the Catholic Church, which retaliates accordingly. In the end, neither side can claim total victory in a war that has become more about political power than religion. In the Peace Accords in Westphalia in 1648, it is proclaimed that every state has the right to decide which religion to embrace. The idea of a unified holy empire is thus abandoned in favour of a system of independent nation-states,
this is the foundation for our modern principle of sovereignty, that no state has the right to interfere in another state's internal affairs, which will apply up until today. An important factor for Western Europe's dynamic developments, which will later lead to a new thought perspective, is the peculiar balance of power that prevails in Europe wherein no one has a secure monopoly on either worldly or spiritual power. Before the Reformation, there are three groups fighting for power, the Church, Kings and the Nobility. After the Reformation, there are five, the Catholic and the Protestant Churches, Kings, Nobility and the new mercantile bourgeoisie. This creates an even stronger dynamic between many competing symbol worlds where no one holds the upper hand. In time, this peculiar dynamic will lead to the scientific revolution, democracy and our modern market-oriented world. But what is science exactly? We might say that it is a method, the so-called natural scientific method, that entails the systematic collection of data through observations, measurements and experiments in combination with the design and trial of hypotheses. The ambition is to let reality speak for itself, to give support as a scientist to a theory when its predictions are confirmed by observations and reject the theory when it does not comply with the facts. This is also called rationalism and is a completely new way of viewing the world that appeared during the early modern period, the foundation of a thought perspective that will eventually replace that of religion. Science also contains a completely new symbolic language, the first truly universal language, based on mathematics, logic and generally recognised measurements and units. Therefore, it is possible, if we learn this language and its symbols, to exchange knowledge and research results with others across cultures who also know the language of science. One of the greatest weaknesses of science, however, is that it cannot explain our inner experience, subjectivity, for the simple reason that only the individual itself has access to the inner experience of truth and that others thereby cannot verify this. But what science lacks in explanatory power for the inner dimensions it compensates for through explaining the external in nature, and it does so in a much more sophisticated and effective way than any other previous symbol system. The explanatory power of science will prove so strong that it will change life on Earth fundamentally. In just a few centuries, culture and society will develop to higher levels of complexity than the previous 6,000 years of civilization combined. However, the scientific revolution as it is spoken of in history books should more accurately be described as an evolution. The development of science stretches far back and has its origin in the axial tradition's ideal of reason, universality and the search for higher principles. The human being has always sought answers to its questions about the world, but this search has not been particularly methodical so far. With the scientific method, we now have a tool to overcome the many limitations and failures of religion. Astronomy is one of the earliest disciplines to be based upon observations and mathematical calculations, as in the advanced geometries seen in ancient Egypt and Babylon, even if it is initially more of a tool for astrology and a contribution to mythology than science in a modern sense. The Greeks were the first to make distinctions between myth and the physical reality that they studied more systematically. The method was uncertain and speculative, but they had good knowledge of geometry, mathematics and logic, which they were some of the first to introduce. During the European Middle Ages, intellectual life mostly revolved around theological issues, but in these issues the Axial Age's reason-based thinking was also applied. In the Islamic world, there were also thinkers who were engaged in the major philosophical issues, but neither there nor in Europe is it yet possible to trace any serious attempts towards modern scientific thinking. The first attempt at something we would term science is made during the 16th century by the astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus, who studies the movements of the planets and realises through mathematical calculations that the Earth revolves around the Sun. The sun is the centre of this cycle, not Earth. 
Thereby we see the birth of the heliocentric worldview, after the Greek word for sun, helios, a view that will challenge the existing geocentrism that has prevailed since antiquity. This conclusion leads to severe misgivings about both Aristotle's physics and the Bible's worldview. Copernicus is, however, politically cautious, only permitting the publication of his conclusions after his death in 1543. As a further precaution, he also proclaims his conclusions to be a mere mathematical model rather than a statement about reality. Copernicus's works, therefore, do not challenge the doctrines of the Church to the same extent that his successors will do. The philosopher and astronomer Giordano Bruno champions Copernicus's theories and is burnt at the stake for this by the Catholic Inquisition in 1600. Clearly, it is still a very dangerous endeavour to challenge the Church at this time. During the end of the 16th century, the Italian scientist Galileo Galilei starts to take an interest in experimental physics and tries out various hypotheses vis-à-vis -vis reality, for example concerning falling objects. He is convinced that the laws of nature can be expressed mathematically. At the start of the 17th century, technology has progressed so far that there are optical instruments to enlarge things we want to study more closely. Galilei sees the promise of this new technology at an early stage. In 1610, he directs his telescope towards the heavens and looks deeper into space than anyone has ever done before. In a short period of time, he makes a string of important discoveries. He observes that Jupiter has moons that orbit the planet, which proves that celestial bodies can have other celestial bodies around them without being in the centre of the universe. There is agreement that the moon revolves around Earth, but now this is no longer a sufficient argument for seeing Earth as the centre of the universe. The Church's last argument for the geocentric worldview thus collapses. The Church long tries to save its worldview when Galilei invites representatives of the Church to see the moons with their own eyes, they refuse. Galilei manages to avoid execution for heresy by renouncing his theory, but several of his colleagues are not as fortunate. In 1609, the astronomer Johannes Kepler formulates mathematical laws for the planet's orbits around the Sun. This confirms Copernicus's heliocentric worldview and Galilei's belief that the laws of nature can be expressed in mathematical terms. Copernicus's and Galilei's discoveries entail a major revision of the human being's view of itself and its place in the world, something that takes a long time to gain acceptance. The human being is displaced from the centre of the world to the periphery. We are still God's creatures, but no longer find ourselves in the centre of creation. The human being can no longer be as certain of its chosenness and special status in the world. In 1620, the English statesman Francis Bacon publishes a work on the scientific method Novum Organum, the new instrument of science. Bacon emphasises the significance of systematic observations and experiments in contrast to pure speculation and philosophical interpretations of religious texts. The theories on systematic observation come to have major influence in natural philosophical circles. Bacon also maintains that science will lead to material benefits for humanity. He is thus one of the first to formulate the idea of progress, one of the cornerstones of the rational thought perspective. In the 17th century, the prominent French philosopher René Descartes emphasises the significance of reason and also doubts its critical concomitant. He is aware that insights and theories must be tested vis-à-vis -vis reality, but argues that empirical observations are not sufficient. He maintains that we must also use reason and doubt to gain insights about reality. Systematically, he subjects existence to philosophical doubt and finally concludes that the only thing he cannot doubt is that he is thinking cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. As Descartes champions reason as the most important avenue for understanding reality, the focus also shifts from God as the primary authority on truth 
to the human being itself. As we become liberated from believing in a divinely revealed truth and with a more reason-based self-consciousness, the ground is laid for the ensuing period of enlightenment and modernity. Meanwhile, Descartes also creates the divide that comes to separate the continental, more inwardly oriented philosophy that he himself represents and the Anglo-Saxon, more empirically based philosophy with Francis Bacon as its main standard bearer. Descartes also repudiates the thought that there is an intrinsic objective telos in nature. He argues that nature contains neither any divine essence nor any natural telos, but he also distinguishes between which principles apply to nature and which apply to the human being. Human consciousness has objectives, meaning and a will in a way that does not exist in material reality, which means that the human being's consciousness is governed by other laws than those of nature. With this reasoning, Descartes resumes the dualism of the axial age. This mind-body dualism has characterized Western thinking since then. By pointing out that different principles apply to our consciousness and the physical world, Descartes also attempts to circumvent the Church's power and supervision. In order to shield science from conflicts with the Church, Descartes suggests that science should merely devote itself to external phenomena and completely leave investigations and speculation about the inner mental phenomena to religion. Previously, ever since the time of Aristotle, physics had mostly revolved around various forms of causal relationships. We had asked ourselves why things happen. Now, physics, with the aid of mathematics, comes into focus in describing how things happen. Within a thirty-year period, we managed to make groundbreaking discoveries within astronomy, develop foundational theories on science, and produce a large number of important empirical studies that all come to shape our scientific thinking to this day. The first scientific academy, the Royal Society, is founded in London in 1660. Shortly thereafter, we get scientific periodicals and peer review papers by independent scientists. The ground is now laid for both the Enlightenment Philosophers' Reason Project and the technological project of the Industrial Revolution. A few decades later, Isaac Newton formulates his laws of motion, having realised that it is the same force that makes an apple fall to the ground that also keeps the moon in its orbit around Earth. With the aid of Newton's mathematical theory of gravitation, it is now possible to explain movements both on Earth and in space. Newton's theory of gravitation and laws of motion are presented in Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, 1687, which becomes the foundation for classical physics. This is usually considered the apex of the scientific revolution, in this work, Newton develops a new symbolic language that constitutes the basis for the mathematical understanding of nature, serving as a model for the natural sciences over the following two centuries. These advances obviously challenge the authority of religion. As we take on the world with reason and empirical exploration, we become our own authorities on what is true, instead of accepting our humble status as God's children in creation. The new natural philosophers, scientists we call them, argue along lines similar to Aristotle that we best attain knowledge of nature through observations and experiments. The men of the church, however, align themselves with Plato's argument that we do not attain the most reliable knowledge of the world through the incomplete information our senses provide us, but through the reflection of pure thought, combined with God's revelations in the Bible. The Church's starting point is that which was assumed to be God's purpose, telos, with various parts of creation. The scientific perspective, however, sees that things lack intrinsic meaning or purpose. The stone does not fall because it wants to fall or has the objective of falling. It is the subject of blind forces of nature that are dependent neither upon humanity nor God, and that are most aptly studied from a purely external, objective perspective. Much of the Church's resistance towards the new science 
is largely the result of science removing telos, i.e. the idea that meaning and objective are built into all parts of creation by the Creator. The major problem for Christianity is not primarily that the world, according to science, proves to be constituted differently to biblical accounts, but that the doctrine of natural law is invalidated. If natural law is discarded, then we can no longer derive an ought from an is, which means that the church's moral doctrine crashes to the ground. The fact that science's narratives do not comport with that of the Bible would in itself have been possible to solve. In the conflict between the Pope and Galilei, the church would have been able to reverse its stand and say that the Bible's narratives should merely be regarded as metaphors. In a conversation with Galilei, Cardinal Baronius famously said that the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. But here, it is not merely a question of the correct reading of the Bible, but about the entire moral philosophy of Catholicism. With the invalidation of natural law, science attacks the foundation for the Church's use of reason. The entire moral system of the Catholic Church is now threatened from two directions, both from Luther and the other reformers who want to remove Logos, and from science which wants to remove Telos. As the symbolic language of the Church itself is under pressure, the Church's dominance over the conceptual world of people is severely threatened, and thereby the social imaginaries on which its power rests. With the rational thought perspective, it now becomes possible to imagine utopia. This means that the old religious notion of a Shangri-La, a harmonious place somewhere far away, ceases to be merely a spatial category and instead becomes a temporal and thus more abstract category in our symbol world. A better society thus lies somewhere in the perhaps not so distant future and of equal importance in this world and not only the next. This line of thought not only revolutionises intellectual life, it also brings radical political uprisings with it. As the possibility of a this-worldly utopia becomes widely rooted in public discourse, it also inscribes itself into the social contract. If you put up with the adversities of life, you should be rewarded not just in the afterlife, but in this one. Accordingly, the rational thought perspective brings further questioning of political authority. We have acquired self-confidence and a will to make our own decisions through reason. In the wake of scientific discoveries, there arises a secular culture of learning in France, with the Great Encyclopedia as one of its prime manifestations. French Enlightenment culture thrives among the bourgeoisie, which has grown wealthy and powerful through the growing significance of trade. Inspired by the political developments in England, cultural salons are organised in France by female salonnières, where science, art, music and politics are freely discussed. This concept, and the entire Enlightenment idea, soon spreads to the rest of Europe. Towards the end of the 18th century, it leads to political revolutions in the English colonies in America, and shortly thereafter, in France itself. During these revolutions, the idea of human rights is developed, and we reawaken the Greek idea of democracy. Even such a peripheral part of Europe as Scotland is affected. One of the Scottish Enlightenment's most luminous figures is David Hume. He formulates what will later be called Hume's Law, based on the aforementioned idea that there is no telos in nature, from which he concludes that an ought cannot be deduced from an is. Hume stresses the decisive distinction between descriptive statements about that which is and ethical, normative statements about that which ought to be, and that we cannot possibly draw an ethical, normative conclusion from the background of a descriptive statement about how something is constituted, the previously mentioned naturalistic fallacy. The problem of how we are able to know what is ethical when we lack guidance from a divine telos in existence leads to the development of a completely new symbolic language within moral philosophy.
This would occupy philosophers and intellectuals for centuries. However, one difficulty is that we increasingly take the dominant natural scientific symbolic language as our starting point. This, of course, merely deals with how reality is not what ought to be and thus cannot serve as the foundation of ethics. Hume's law sheds light on important issues, but the dominance of natural scientific symbolic language creates a blockage vis-à-vis -vis an idea-based development of moral philosophy. The lack of a moral philosophical symbolic language approaching the interoperable empirical standards of science still eludes us to this day. As a reaction against the Enlightenment's cult of reason, a counter-movement known as Romanticism emerges during the first half of the 19th century. Philosophers, above all the German idealists, once again direct our attention inwards to explore our own subjectivity and consciousness. Herder, Schiller, Goethe and Hegel, along with others, develop insightful theories about our consciousness and its development throughout life. Positivism, which arises with Auguste Comte's theories in the 1830s and 40s, will, however, during the early 20th century, outcompete the idealists' philosophies on consciousness. Positivism contributes an important symbolic system that enriches and supports the natural sciences. It emphasises facts that are based on measurable sensory experiences where the role of the researcher is to find regularities in both nature and society. Through the charting of regularities, one can then predict future events. Our individual subjective perspective is seen by positivism as more of a problem to be eliminated than a phenomenon to study. This would become a precept for science up until the present day and it will be thoroughly questioned only a hundred years later by post-rational or post-modern philosophers during the 20th century. The rational thought perspective is also applied to biology, most prominently perhaps in relation to the mechanisms of creation. Charles Darwin's groundbreaking theory of evolution is published in 1859, Darwin understands the mechanisms of natural selection and gives an explanation as to why animals and plants look the way they do. It would then appear a natural conclusion that it also ought to be so. Darwin himself is aware of the distinction between ought and is, i.e. normative vis-à-vis -vis descriptive statements. This, however, would not stop the erroneous idea of social Darwinism the idea that the right of the mighty to dominate the weak is given by nature, which came to be a prominent and unfortunate feature of European thought. With Darwin's theory, which first meets with heavy resistance, we once again have to revise our view of ourselves, just as with Copernicus's discovery of the Earth's emplacement. We are no longer created in the image of God, we are not God's chosen people, this severely upsets the current moral order and results in considerable resistance against Darwin's theories that has lasted to this day, not least from religious communities. We are now merely a variety of an improbably smart ape on the outskirts of the universe. The human being is forced to rethink. We have to change our way of viewing ourselves and our self-proclaimed chosenness, our place in the world and in creation. In the great cosmos, humanity is no longer a movie star in Hollywood in the glow of divine camera flashes. Now we are merely a cosmic coincidence of minuscule importance to the greater picture. One way of handling this is to gaze outwards and instead focus on the new opportunities of science and rationality. The existential issues about the purpose of humans and their place in the world are pushed aside and focus is instead directed towards the purpose of mastering the world. What makes natural science so revolutionising is that it only cares about what works and does not need to understand why. If telos does not exist, and the human being's primary quality is logos, then individuals might be able to create their own objectives. Armed with this conviction, and the symbol tools of the scientific method to make accurate predictions, we then embark on a path to subject the natural world to our will.
the Industrial Revolution that begins in Britain in the late 18th century is a result of the new rational thought perspective that is gradually taking over at this time. But initially, it occurs somewhat independently of the natural sciences. Industrialization progresses for the first century or so, largely independent of scientific institutions, and is pioneered by people without any formal scientific education. The engineers who build the new machines and tools of industry simply rely on trial and error and common sense rather than scientific theories. However, it is probably no coincidence that it is in Britain, where the new scientific thoughts are particularly widespread, that the Industrial Revolution first takes off. Apart from the sheer luck of being positioned on huge deposits of coal to be used as cheap fuel for the steam engines, and a large colonial empire from which raw material can be acquired and to where industrial products can be exported, the circumstance that the rational thought perspective has already become well established in British culture during the 18th century, exemplified by its parliamentary system, mercantile policies and scientific institutions, most likely plays a critical role as well. The presence of these inherently rational phenomena indicates that Britons, to a larger degree than others at the time, subscribed to the rational thought perspective, and that British culture was imbued by the ethos of reason. This must have, arguably, as ripples on a pond, affected a considerable number of people outside of formal scientific institutions, including those who pioneered the many ingenious inventions and rational productive measures of the Industrial Revolution. The rational thought perspective, especially in regards to objectivity, natural science and the practical appliance of these, thus had a strong position and a long tradition within British culture prior to the Industrial Revolution. I believe it is reasonable to suppose that without the apparent circumstance of a modern, scientific and secular symbolic worldview to prevail among a sufficiently large part of the population, the Industrial Revolution simply would not have occurred. The Royal Society, the first modern scientific institution in the world, and the Bank of England, one of the first modern national banks, created largely to support overseas expansion and to protect the interests of the country's commercial elite, are both evidence of how particularly modern and thus rational British society is at the beginning of the 18th century. Britain is even one of the first societies to systematically grant temporary monopolies on inventions in the form of patenting, so as to encourage technological progress by enabling inventors to turn a profit from their inventions. As the first industrialised nation in the world, Britain quickly becomes the wealthiest and most powerful state on the global stage. It uses its newly won economic muscles and industrial technologies to expand its empire, which, during the 19th century, becomes the biggest the world has ever seen. British advances in industry are duly noted elsewhere and soon spread across Europe, North America and, somewhat later, to Japan. During the second half of the 19th century, technological progress shifts into a higher gear and picks up pace as science is increasingly applied to industry. Inspired by the utility of science in industry, we soon begin to apply scientific thought to ever more aspects of life. Much medical progress is thus made during the 19th century, causing life expectancies to increase and mortality rates to decrease while scientific methods applied to agriculture increase food production considerably, with the result that European populations grow excessively, creating a large surplus of people to conquer and colonise a world that is becoming more European. Our improved comprehension of science also enables us to develop more efficient methods of warfare. The invention of the steam engine can be used to propel large armed ships and our increased knowledge about metallurgy and ballistics can be used to make deadlier and more efficient artillery pieces. Chemistry gives us dynamite, and with the invention of vaccines, Europeans can now send soldiers into areas of the world where they would otherwise have died from tropical diseases. It becomes increasingly obvious that the military commanders who rely on new technologies will be victorious in battle, 
and that only the nations with the industrial capacities to equip their armies with all the latest gadgets will have a chance to retain their independence. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, the nations that embrace science and industrialism succeed in gaining control over large parts of the world, ensuring a technological and economic head start that has endured to this day. It is little wonder that science and the rational thought perspective succeed in outcompeting religion as the dominant symbolic languages in the world. As soon as a meme can provide strong competitive advantages, as evidently demonstrated by science and industrialism, the consequence will either be that the new thought perspective is embraced or that one's culture is substantially disfavoured in the competition and risks obliteration. Accordingly, an evolutionary race has now kicked in and there is no doubt about the outcome. Those who adapt to the new rules of the game will triumph and the most important battlefield is now how well we succeed in industrialising our nations. During the 19th and 20th centuries, the West goes from being dominated by agrarian communities, where the majority of the population live in the countryside and work as farmers, to industrial societies, where most of us live in cities and work in manufacturing or service. The process is rapid and transforms society significantly. But, like the transition to agriculture, the transition to industrialism is far from a one-sided blessing as with the agricultural revolution, the changes from the new industrial lifestyle also bring new stresses and maladies to life. Once again, working days become longer, and with highly rationalised work patterns in the factories, work becomes even more monotonous and harder to endure. It is also dangerous to work here, since powerful and fast-moving machines can easily rip off a limb if one is not careful. Mines are also an exceptionally precarious work environment where the risk of being buried alive is a daily concern. Even though industrialism will increase the living standards of common people later on, initially it actually increases mortality and gives rise to new diseases. The lack of sunlight in the mines and factories causes vitamin D deficiencies, resulting among other things in misshapen skeletons known as the English disease. The pollution from industry also deteriorates our environment and we risk being poisoned by the air and water near factories. People thus have good reasons to avoid the transition to life as industrial workers. So as with the transition to agriculture, industrialism is likewise driven by necessity rather than free choice, at least for the workers. While the owners of factories reap great benefits, the people who work in these dangerous and dirty environments are mainly forced to do so because they lack other means to support themselves. This will dramatically alter the economic relations of society. It has been argued that the steep gradients of wealth and economic mobility in industrial societies encourage innovation and competition. Since entrepreneurs rely entirely on the market and are constantly at risk of being outcompeted by others, and do not have any land to fall back on from where they can sustain themselves. They are constantly forced to innovate and compete to a much higher degree than the elites of the agrarian era. An unsuccessful feudal lord could always extract some resources from his lands, but if the business of an entrepreneur becomes unprofitable, he loses all his means to make a living. Similarly, since the industrial workers do not have access to any land from which they can have their basic needs met, and since they are constantly at risk of being replaced by cheaper and more skilful labour, they too are forced to compete by improving their productivity. The threat of unemployment has therefore been argued to be far more effective in increasing labour productivity than slavery or serfdom. A feudal landowner cannot afford to let his serfs or slaves starve, and at the same time these workers have very little incentive to increase their productivity. If the lord loses his peasants to famines, he loses his economic foundation, and if a peasant puts any extra effort into his work, whatever surplus he produces will simply be appropriated by his master. Accordingly, the old economic system does not stimulate worker creativity or productivity.
but in capitalist industrial societies, the lack of any secure means of subsistence fosters a level of self-discipline that was difficult to accomplish in previous modes of production. Capitalism, it has been argued by David Christian, generates a discipline that touches the intellect, the psyche and the bodies of wage workers with a power unattainable through the more direct and brutal methods typical of tributary societies. And since innovation seems to be never-ending in modern society, both workers and capitalists find themselves on a relentless treadmill of constantly rising productivity. As such, capitalist industrialism fosters far greater efficiency than the economic systems before it. The workers are no longer the property of their masters, as legally they are equal to those who employ them. Accordingly, the workers are free to sustain themselves in any way they feel fit. However, exactly because they are no longer the subjects of anyone else, the responsibilities that the agrarian masters were expected to fulfil towards their subjects no longer apply. Opposition to the new conditions begins to take form during the 19th century as the new industrial working class grow increasingly better organised. In 1848, Marx and Engels published the Communist Manifesto, where it is proclaimed that, in place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. A call for a revolution to sweep away all ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions, where all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned. After all, the manifesto concludes, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. As the spectre of communism and the call for working men of all countries to unite begins to gain ground among workers and intellectuals during the second half of the 19th century, it starts to scare the ruling classes who desperately search for new meaning-creating narratives to fill the void in our shared symbol world that the demise of religion has left us, which communism, among other things, is a response to. The bourgeois elites partly succeed by spreading the idea of nationalism, a new narrative or social imaginary to bolster loyalty to the state, create mutual bonds and feelings of communion, and foster a shared identity among the people who have come from the many different provinces around the country to work and cooperate in the growing and densely populated industrial cities. The attempt is largely successful, but it does not make way with the demands for social justice. Neither does it remedy the alienation or identity crisis that many experience in modern life. The new conditions in industrial society urgently require a new symbolic language to address the dire needs of those who have ended up at the bottom of the social pyramid. As the old religious thought perspective comes tumbling down amidst the rapid changes of industrialization and breakthroughs in science, a pressing need for a new shared symbol world gets increasingly apparent. Science takes over parts of the authority that religion previously monopolized in the agrarian era. Science enjoys major prestige and provides us with an astonishing number of answers to factual issues, but it cannot provide us with guidance above all on moral issues, and it does not have the same cultural and identity-creating power as religion. At an early stage, Marxism lays claim to being a scientific theory on historical development and economics, but it also becomes a sort of pseudo-religion that fulfills many of the functions religion used to serve. Although religion is still considered an important institution to ensure societal stability by the conservatives of the day, it is not only the Marxists who turn away from God. The rest of society also becomes more secularised. The growing bourgeoisie increasingly put their faith in science rather than God, and political leaders increasingly rely on more secular means of governance than religious ones. The church is bit by bit separated from the state during the 19th century as religious authorities gradually lose their grip on the public imagination. The secularization of society is an important step towards the final victory of the rational thought perspective. 
It is a prerequisite for globalization and internationalization in a positive sense, since it better enables us to relate to people from other religious backgrounds without the prejudices and narrow-minded views of our own religious context. Yet, at the same time, the waning of religion leaves a void in its wake. Who will now answer existential questions? What should we base morality on? Science cannot say what is right and wrong, and a science without morals can easily lose its foothold. Moreover, science and atheism may make us more sober in our thinking, but by the same token we lose the ability to indulge ourselves in the intoxicating experiences of higher meaning and beauty that religious practices and communities can provide. So, as we get exposed to the stronger truth claims of science and our religious sentiments fade, we sober up and see the world in a much bleaker, disenchanted and more mechanistic light. The morning after religion we thus wake up hungover, pondering what we have lost. As we leave our sheltered existence of the village and move into the rapidly growing urban centres, we suddenly find ourselves as newcomers in an alien environment that ruptures our sense of self, others and the world. The social fabric of the old society on which we used to rely and where everyone knew their place is severely fractured by the rapid advancements of modern life. It is liberating, it is scary, it is beautiful, it is different. Our old narratives do not suffice as our old collective imaginaries crumble. They are increasingly outdated and doomed to the mimetic graveyard of history. The new conditions in modern society desperately call for a new symbol world in order for us to make sense of it all. While science takes over religion's role as our primary authority on truth, it cannot generate the warm feelings of communion with other people that we can experience in religious communities. Accordingly, new political ideologies take over many of the functions of religion in regards to identity and purpose. In extension of this, the welfare state eventually starts to take over the church's function as the provider of care and protection in times of need. However, none of the new institutions of modern society seem to adequately satisfy our higher emotional and, with a word that has now been largely forgotten, more spiritual needs. The truth proclamations of science rarely come close to the divine revelations of religion in terms of beauty and invigoration of the soul. The political ideologies have difficulties in fostering enduring identities that make us feel deeply connected to the society we live in. And even if the expanding welfare state manages to drastically increase our standard of living and material security during the 20th century, it lacks the spiritual nourishment and mental strength that religion used to give us. So, as we venture into modernity and beyond, more knowledgeable than ever, healthier and wealthier than any of our ancestors could dream of, as we enjoy all the fruits of industrial society that would make any king or emperor of the past envious, it is as if something vital is missing. For all the blessings of the brave new world, it is as if something has been lost. As a consequence, we feel alienated, more disconnected from the world, and start to numb our existential anxieties with passing worldly pleasures to satisfy our immediate desires. However, on the peripheries of society, at distances far enough from the circles of power to be absorbed by them, but close enough to affect the prevailing power order, new righteous rebels stand ready to challenge the maladies of modern society head on.